actually means it's time to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. that's how they do it in all the lines. Okay, welcome along, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's really exciting what we've managed to, to put together, thanks to Google, just mention them. Uh, and uh, I'm quite keen to sort of go head first with education. So I'd like to actually do some stuff. And then in about an hour, we're going to actually have the introductions and welcomes and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I just want to launch straight into what, what we're doing, and, and then we'll sort of get introduced to that a wee bit later on. But uh, we've got people from all over New Zealand, uh, from as far north, north of Auckland, yep, and south of Christchurch. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a, a long way apart. It's pretty exciting. Um, so my name's Tim Bell, in case you haven't met me, and, uh, but we've got a variety of people in uh, during the day, and again, I'll introduce most of them a bit later on. Um, the thing I want to do first is just talk about why on earth um, Google would pay for a whole lot of teachers all over New Zealand to come together and do this. Um, and uh, so, so here we go. Um, oops. Oh, by the way, if you need internet, uh, I've written it up on the board here too. So it's uh, just on the side of the board, and there's some labs upstairs, but we'll, we'll remind you of that later on. Um, but the wireless passwords are over there. So the, um, the purpose of what we're doing today really is uh, in two days we're not going to teach all of computer science or, or anything like that, but I'm aware that many of you have taught computer science for the first time this year into year 11s uh, as a subject, and many of you are planning to do it next year for year 11 and year 12 students, and that's pretty exciting. We're one of the first countries in the world to do that. Um, which means we're kind of on the bleeding edge, and especially those who did it this year, and especially those who did it under some extreme circumstances in Christchurch, um, really were um, sort of pushing out there a lot, and the rest of the world was watching us, and that's cool. Um, that's New Zealand for you. Uh, but what I hope to do in two days is that to give you a bit of a vision for what we're teaching, because, um, I mean, how many people here actually have a qualification that's got the name computer science in it? With the name, oh, sorry, you, you've actually you, you've got a degree in computer science or something? Wow, okay, cool. I think we must have almost everyone in New Zealand who's got that qualification. <laughs> um, because based on the surveys and so on, very few people have actually had training in that. Uh, and, and so that, that takes me straight to point three here, which is peer support. There are some people here, you just saw their hands go up, who probably feel moderately confident with what we're doing. Um, there are probably other people here who probably are still wondering what on earth this whole thing is about. Uh, and, and so we're going to be all over the place, um, but we all deserve to be nervous because we are some of the first people in the world to be, be teaching this stuff. Uh, and so uh, the idea is just to equip you as best we can to do that. But one, one of the things about um, having a vision for teaching, I, um, I went to a competition on Friday night. A friend of ours uh, was in a concerto competition. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the National Concerto Competitions. There's this <coughs> ridiculously accomplished uh, instrumentalists play, uh, they compete to play with an orchestra and there's three places in the entire country and there were 70 competitors from around the country <coughs> it's just an astonishing event and three of them uh, get selected and uh, one of our, a friend of a friend of ours got selected and I was talking to her about um, her teacher uh, and so it turns out that her teacher would not even be able to play the concerto that she won first place with, right? And uh, I suspect there's probably quite a few people here who probably might not feel that you could ever be a computer scientist or might not be a, a gun programmer or something, but you're here because you're teachers. And you're here because you've got a vision of what your students might be able to do. And it's perfectly reasonable to teach someone, even though you don't feel super qualified in that area, as long as you've got the vision for what they should be doing, as long as you can tell when they're doing things right, and as long as you can provide them with guidance. And so, um, obviously, the, the more capable you are the, in the area, the better. And, um, but one of the things that we're going to do over the next couple of days is we've got people coming uh, from industry and from academics and all sorts of people, um, students, who are going to talk to you about what they do and what's important to them, so that you kind of you know get a bit of a, a sample of what's going on around the place, and you can place these very esoteric topics that you've been asked to teach um, in, a, in a much bigger context. And so that's something that's going to be quite important. Um, there will be some specific ideas. So some of the sessions will just be, look, here's a way to teach this new standard. Um, but 
just be aware that some of the stuff we're doing, um, in fact, the session after morning tea, I've got uh, one of the top researchers in the world in human computer interaction who's going to talk about his work. Um, you will not be teaching what he does to your students, but you will be able to teach having seen what your students might be doing in five or six years' time if they become PhD students researching that area. Um, so, so take some of it with a grain of salt. Uh, you will, I've asked people for opinions, and I'm not going to try and moderate them too much, so you will get opinions all over the place. Uh, we may have a programming language war at some stage about what's the best language to teach um, in the friendliest possible way. Um, one thing that I will take as a given is we've got these standards and we're going to try and get our students through them. Uh, there is a whole issue about what should be in the standards and how they should be and all that sort of thing. Uh, that's fine to talk about in the tea breaks and so on, but we're not here to sort that problem out. Um, and the other big thing I think is it's time for refreshment for you guys too, because you've earned it. Uh, man, it's December and it's been quite a year, uh, and uh, it always is usually, and my wife is a teacher, I know what it's like to be a teacher in December. Uh, and uh, so I hope that we can also give you a bit of relaxation and just a, um, you know, a little bit of uh, entertainment in that as well. So it's not all serious. <coughs> your job is to work out which bits are serious and which bits are <laughs> not. It might be a bit of a job. Um, now, just out of interest, I, I've actually, any time anyone asks me to talk, I, I start talking. Um, and so I've, I've given talks in, uh, all over the country over the last year or two. Um, how many people have actually sort of heard a rant from me at some stage in the last year or so? Oh, okay, right. So, <laughs> they still came back. Um, so one of the things, you, and, uh, for those who haven't, um, one of the things, and I'll just go over this uh, briefly, is um, this idea of users. That there are only two industries that refer to their customers as users. Um, and that until now, so, so you know, in schools, you probably most of you are training your students to be one of those kinds of users, right? A computer user, um, and people, the politicians think that this is a really good thing to do, and it, and it is. <coughs> Welcome, Anthony. Anthony is uh, going to be presenting later on today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, Anthony Robbins is our expert on the programming stuff, by the way. So he's he's my counterpart down in Otago. <coughs> I'm going to be focusing on the computer science stuff. Uh, Okay, so we're talking about users, and uh, of course the other kind of users you're not allowed to train your students to do, in fact, you, you know, they get in trouble if they, if they start doing that sort of thing. So, but the funny thing with users is that they pay to use, and you, know, you might think, oh, there's all this free software out there and all that sort of stuff, but the reality is someone at Google or Facebook or YouTube or TradeMe or whatever is making millions of dollars because you are using their website um, somehow or other, and so ultimately users pay. Um, either with time or with information or with money or whatever. And as a country, we, we do need to all be able to use computers and that sort of stuff, but it's not the thing that's going to drive the economy or anything. Of course, we want to be the people that develop uh, software as well. And so the focus of what we're doing in, in programming computer science is that the hope that a few students might actually become developers, that they might develop <coughs> the next big thing um, that brings money into New Zealand instead of sending money out of New Zealand. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big political driver behind a lot of this. Um, the reason industry support is they just can't hire enough graduates, and so that's, that's one of the drivers there. Um, but just to put things in perspective, um, typically it's called computer studies or IT or ICT. It's got, it's, the whole naming in this area is really confusing. Um, but you know, learning to use software. Um, and then a lot of schools that, until before this year were teaching computer programming, which is how to actually make software. But what we really need is a definition for computer science. Um, and computer science isn't about just making the software that actually, you know, that just works, but it's actually making software that is fast, or efficient, or reliable, or secure, or usable, or scalable, or delightful, or intelligent, or visual. Um, in other words, you can write a program that does something, but it might be slow, and if your computer to write it's the same thing and it's fast, you know, which one's going to sell? Uh, you might have something that works really well, but it's not that secure. You know, people can break into it and get personal information out of it. And that, it's, it's basically useless, even though it works. Um, so how do you make things secure? <coughs> Scalable. Um, you could write, you set up a, a new business that, that works really well, but it can be so successful, and this happens in real life. It gets so successful that it, it's a victim of its own success, and the computers can't keep up. Because it turns out that you know when you've got 
hundred times as many users, then it's going to, you know, you need a thousand times the resources to run your programs or something like that. Um, delightful, you want people to actually think that it's cool um, and talk about it and blog about it and all that sort of thing. And that's a little bit more to do with the interface design. And it's not just about making it glitzy, it's that we'll look more carefully at that. Um, intelligent software and we'll look, uh, look a bit at artificial intelligence. And also just visual, how do you actually make things uh, you know, interesting graphics and all that. And, and by the time you mix all that up, you suddenly end up with a discipline that's, that's quite complicated. But that's kind of the outcome of the discipline of computer science. And so I thought, and that's my definition by the way, I don't I've never seen that anywhere, but it, that's sort of a summary of all the stuff that goes on. But I thought I'd stick that up um, there so that as we go through stuff, we can kind of maybe tick some of those boxes. So, tick some of those boxes. So, why would a company like Google pay megabucks for you guys to fly in here. Well, um, you've probably seen this quite a bit because it's an old graph, but around about year 2000, everyone wants to do computer science. The web was the next big thing, and people were enrolling in universities, and there was no problem finding people who to do it. But for various reasons, which I won't go into detail, but more to do with image and um, uh, marketing and news reports and so on, people, real, well, people thought that there were no jobs in computer science. And this is in America, but it's pretty much the same in New Zealand. The number of people enrolled in computer science has dropped by about 70% in the last decade. This is doing computer science at universities. And it's throughout New Zealand, and it's throughout America, and it's in the UK, and all the Western countries. Asia, no problem, because everyone wants a high-paying job, they want to get into whatever, you know, if you say, do you want to be a computer scientist? Sure, I'll be a computer scientist, just tell me what I have to do. Um, but here, it's like computers, oh, I know that's really boring, um, not interested. And as a consequence, we end up not having people who can make things fast and efficient and reliable. Sure, you get people who can write programs that do, do things, but they're not necessarily going to have all those problems. And even worse, if you look at the number of females that are interested, these are percentages, it's, it's a tiny fraction. And again, it's a lot to do with image. Females often do, generally, do quite well in computer science, but their impression is that it, that it must be just programming and technical stuff that wouldn't be very interesting. And so, again, one of the big roles that you have, really, is, that, is because there's this shrinking pipeline that they talk about. A lot of girls never make it into computing at school. Even fewer carry on through university, even fewer carry on after that. Yeah. I think there's many people that teach themselves. They haven't actually gone to university, but taught themselves. People who teach themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's plenty of people, but not, not so much computer science. Not, um, <coughs> there might be people who develop new systems, but then they'll hire a computer scientist to make it fast, or to make it secure, or make it reliable. Yeah. Um, so, the whole idea behind getting computer science into NCA was primarily just that students would find out what computer science is, because most, it, and I, every time I go to a class I ask them what computer science is, and, well, you get blank stares anyway, right? But uh, usually it's like, oh, computers and stuff, or maybe fixing computers, or working out how to use Windows, or, uh, you know, and, and, and I mean, you try it on your students if you haven't. Has anyone tried that, by the way? Um, but they have no idea that there's all these techniques out there, and so the, the big goal is just to say, look, here's a few techniques from computer science. A few of you might think that's quite cool. A lot of you might think, well, who cares? And that's fine, you know, you, you, might, you might want to be computer scientists, but at least they've got an idea what it is. Very trendy thing, especially in America, is computational thinking. Um, getting students with a solution to a problem isn't just a, a number or an idea, but it's a process, and in other words, an algorithm in the language of computer science. And so, you know, we've got this problem of, you know, how do you get everyone registered, or how do you get everyone on the aeroplane, or how do you do your shopping, or something like that. And what process is going to be an efficient way of doing that, rather than just say, oh, just do, you know, the next one next, and the next one next, and thinking through that. Um, and that's a skill that's sort of getting on the radar for schools. Um, as I talk about before, not people who develop stuff, not just using it. And a little bit, a little bit part is preparing people so that when they hit tertiary or industry out of school, that they're actually kind of ready to, ready to roll. But um, the amount of stuff that's in there, it's, it's, it's useful, um, it will make a difference, but it's not essential, it never has been. But the, the really big role is that people actually know where they're headed. Um, and, and I've used this quote lots of times, it's uh, from this, this very old book. Um, the greatest tragedy I know of, so many young people never discover what they really want to do. 
uh, and we've got so many students in our department who have accidentally got into computer science. Um, and so you wonder how many of them uh, haven't turned up because they didn't have that accident where they bumped into someone who was doing it or they were forced to enroll because they had an empty slot on their schedule or something like that. Um, so it's, a, it's about giving an opportunity to students. And if you want to find out what it is, well, you can go to Wikipedia, which has got this slightly tedious definition. Uh, <laughs> theoretical foundations and so on. But if you look at the very first examples it gives, the first thing is computational complexity theory. And so, this thing I'll stick up with. We've got this um, standard. How many people taught the 91074, or used the 91074 standard this year? So about, about a quarter of you perhaps, or something? Yeah, great. Um, and it, it had three bullet points in it. And we, we're gonna do one of these in a minute. Um, but Basically, I'll summarise them in a, in a few words, but one of them was that you should be able, the students should be able to work out the cost of an iterative algorithm. And the next one was that they should understand the role of programming languages. And the other one was that they need to do a little bit about the usability of an interface. Okay. Now, if you look at, the, and this is just by coincidence, look at Wikipedia's definition, computational complexity theory is about the cost of an algorithm. It's, and we'll, we'll use, talk about some of these words in a while, but it's basically how long does it take to run a program? Um, programming language theory, the second bullet point, and human computer action, the third bullet point. So, you know, these are core ideas from computer science that students are being exposed to in, in the year 11 um, standard. The, there's a slightly fuller list if you go a bit further down Wikipedia. Um, and again, picking things off, um, most of these topics, well, I'll highlight the ones that are actually in the level 1, 2, and to level three standards. Um, but the, so the level one and two standards are uh, out now for next year, and there's, there's a copy of them in your conference bag, so we've printed off a copy because we'll probably refer to them a wee bit. Um, so information coding theory, that's in the 2.44 standard, which I'll stick up here. So the second bullet point is encoding information. Um, <coughs> the Algorithms and data structures, the level one standard. Programming languages, level one. Artificial intelligence is up at level three standard. Graphics and visualization, level three. Security is level two. And software engineering, which actually is when you formalize computer programming into, into a system that uh, can be used by uh, large numbers of people working together, um, is something that come out of programming, but also is touched on level three as, as a discipline. So, so that's what computer science is. It's not just sort of something esoteric that people do, it's what people like Google look for, the skills that people like Google look for when they hire people. And so the simple reason that, that they're paying for you to be here is that at the moment, uh, so Google have a branch in Sydney, they're the ones who are directly sponsoring us here. Uh, I think they had 300 engineers at the start of this year and they wanted to grow by 50%. So they need to hire in the last year, I haven't asked them how they got on, 150 people. Now our department would produce probably two people that would be both interested and eligible for what they do, because they, they do hire the premium crop. Um, and so around New Zealand they might get a dozen people if they're lucky. Around Australia, maybe a few dozen. And where are they going to get the other hundred of? And well, which countries are people putting their hands up to do computer science? And so they're going to have to fill out immigration forms and get people from overseas and all, all that sort of stuff, which is fine, but um, what about all those people in New Zealand and Australia who would have enjoyed it but thought that they didn't like it? That's, that's the main thing that they're concerned about. So basically, as far as Google's concerned, they just want to, um, you know, it's the rising tide lifts all the ships. They, they, they want to lift the numbers of students who are doing computer science massively so that when they go to pick off the best ones, and for your students, um, a year 11 student, you're talking about probably almost 10 years time by the time they're doing a PhD or something, uh, then there will be three times as many, ten times as many for them to, to pick off. Who knows what Google will be doing in ten years' time, but that's, that's quite a vision that they've got to actually do that. Um, just a few statistics, and again, I think most of you have probably seen this, um, but the, the registrations for these standards this year, um, this was um, Paul Matthews' blog, this in the New Zealand Computer Society blog, um, that so just a big beam diagram. Uh, so these are the, the three main standards that we're going to be interested in uh, for these next couple of days, which is 
computer science designing a program and implementing a program, and they've just changed names a wee bit, uh, those two. Um, the, so 741 students registered for every single one. These were provisional numbers, but roughly 700 students around New Zealand were, were doing all three of those. Um, and then if we sort of take the whole group together, so nearly 1,500 were doing the computer science standard in total. Um, 1,600 were designing programs, and 2,700 were implementing programs. Um, and so it's a fair whack of students who are doing that stuff that didn't have the opportunity to do it the year before, particularly the computer science stuff. Um, just out of interest, uh, um, how many people actually taught one of those standards this year? So, most of you? Yeah. Um, how many people have done the 91074 standard this year? Yeah. Great. There's your peer support, everyone else. Okay. <laughs> So, um, I've, late, later on I've asked Anthony to, to focus more on these two standards, which is, um, actually that's the old name there now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. we've, we've got rid of the word algorithm out of the name of the standard, which is very deliberate because um, we also had algorithms in the uh, 91074 standard, and they kind of meant different things, and it was very, very confusing for people. And the phrase algorithmic structure isn't really a technical term for anything in particular, it's just designing programs. So the, the standard is now called something like uh, designing a program. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on, on this one here and the corresponding uh, level 2 one. And Anthony's going to particularly concentrate on the level 2 equivalents of these. Um, and in fact, um, how many people are familiar with the book that Sandy and Anthony have done this year? So they've been Mailing it out to how many people? Lots? Oh, uh, about 90. About 90 people, right. Chapter by chapter, draft by draft. Getting quality feedback with all sorts of ideas for how to improve it. No, so. no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> we start off thinking, we'll, we'll just give teachers heaps of things and ask them to fine tune it for us, but it turns out I think most of you would rather just use it as it is and trust us or something. That'd be welcome feedback, yeah. Find out if it actually works. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so in the next um, three quarters of an hour or so, what I thought I'd do is actually teach some level one computer science, which a lot of you have, um, but I, I got to do it this year too. Thanks to well, welcomed into some uh, classrooms. Uh, and uh, it, it was actually really neat to work with some year 11 students um, doing this stuff because uh, they seem to pick it up really quickly. I mean, they, it depends probably on which classes you've got and so on. Um, and, I've, and I've done a lot of this stuff with um, teachers too. And we managed to get through most of those three bullet points in about two hours usually. Uh, it's actually worth three credits, so that's 30 hours of... Um, learning, teaching and learning time in principle, um, but by the time the students write it all up and all that sort of stuff, it, it, it can sort of take a bit of time. Um, the format that NZQA came up for the assessment is that, you know, it's a written report, no more than 14 pages, although I think probably, I mean, probably five or six would be enough to cover most of it, would it? Yeah? Yeah, so, you know, a, a good student would be writing five or six pages. Um, this is stuff that we're used to doing in exams, and exams would be nice, but it's just sort of an option, so, so there you go. But as it happens, actually, writing reports is probably quite a good message to send to potential computer science students, because if they don't like writing reports, they're probably going to you know, grind them to the dust pretty soon and um, look for jobs and things like that, because it's very much about communication and working with people and explaining what you've done and documenting what you've done and so on. So um, it's actually not a, not a bad exercise to have to do. Um, so, yeah, let's, um, let's do some algorithm comparison. So what I thought I'd spend a bit of time doing is look at the cost of an iterative algorithm for a problem of size n. Yeah. Um, now, one technique that, um, I wonder how many people, how many people have used a phone book to, to teach this idea? A couple? Okay, cool. Um, so I've got, got two phone books here, and um, I'm going to... The way I like to do is we'll have a race that they're both Christchurch phone books. Um, it's two likely people. Uh, and the name 
I would like, actually, if you could just uh, <coughs> my name in the phone book, so it's the name Bell. Interesting thing is, a lot of Year 11s have never seen a phone book before. <laughs> 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 Uh, at least in my experience. And even, even when we, we tried to get them to do it, some just said, I'll oh, just Google their name. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Another. You live in uh, Darwin? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So you just found Bell T in there. Very good. Um, we're still going over here. Oh, I'll stop because he did. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there. And yeah, some of this the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it went from A to E. I was confused. Yeah. Um, so, some of you may have seen my, my phone book. I've got a friend who's a bookbinder, and what we did is we chopped mm. the spine off, shuffled the pages, and found it back together. It went from A to E, I stopped. Which. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now there's a couple of lessons here. So, um, but one is that having things in sorted order is really worthwhile. Uh, and um, but but the other thing is that we can actually analyse these algorithms. And so, a bit of terminology. Um, so an algorithm is just a process for doing something. And each of you is probably using some sort of algorithm, some process to try and find my name in there. Um, and the technical phrase that we use is analyze an algorithm, which almost always means how fast is it. Okay? Sometimes it means how much memory is it going to use and what resources is it going to use in some terms. But almost always we just want to generalize, is this algorithm fast or slow? Now, we had two algorithms. Well, for this, for this book, there's a, there's a very efficient algorithm that we can use. Um, and in fact, it's called a linear interpolation search, which in fact, I probably wouldn't bother teaching. Um, but it's like what the, uh, the binary search. Okay, so how many people have come across the idea of binary search? Okay, so you could probably all do it. It's very straightforward. You're looking for the name Bell, so you start in the middle, and yes. That's one of the problems that I have with the binary search for the telephone book. Is that I would never start in the middle looking for Bell. No, no, you wouldn't. Because I've got some other knowledge that would say I'm going to start near the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, one of the um, well, there's two things you can do. So one is um, to say, well, just bear with me, let's do it this way. Um, <laughs> the other thing that uh, I've sometimes done is um, have numbered ping pong balls over cups, and they're not linear, right? So the numbers are all over the place. You can't figure out. So they're in order, they're sorted, but just because I asked for the number 500, you've no idea whether it's at the right end or the beginning end. And even if you do find one, you've no idea whether the one next to it is a thousand or three or whatever. Um, so you can make up your own data. Um, it can be um, things in envelopes, that sort of stuff. That's what. It'll be the last number to the middle of the alphabet, because I can't use it. Right. Oh, oh. that was interesting. Yeah, it was. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, building, this building is run by a computer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which yes, which means it usually works. How you want it. Microsoft or? Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Um, I suspect it is. Okay, so we, so one algorithm you could use, bear with me, is we'll start in the middle and it's Mally. Okay, and so um, is the name Bell in the left hand side or the right hand side? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> that's a job. so I've reduced the size of the problem by. <laughs> 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 I've reduced the pop. <laughs> Gotta be careful not to do the other book too. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've reduced the size of the problem by half, and so now I look at the middle of that one, and it's F for fitness. So you have to left or the right hand half. Not as impressive, it's only half the size. Yeah. Um, and then we go in half, it says C. So you want left or right. Yeah. F. <laughs> And go in the middle of that, and we've got Bragg. Right? right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the middle of that, we've got Eskin. Right. Right, right hand side. Okay. And in the middle of these two pages, Bias. 
Right. You're simulating students for me. This is, this is very well done. Yeah. Okay. Middle of this Barnet. Right. Okay. Um, this Bell. Got it. Yeah. Um, uh, do you know? Because it might be bells. In fact, as it happens, it is, yes. Yeah. Um, but we didn't actually need to rip up the phone book to do this experiment. Um, so what we can do is uh, a thought experiment. And in fact, it's the... Uh, a lot of these things uh, make good spreadsheet exercises, by the way. So, there, there were 600 pages in that phone book, and when the first time I ripped it in half, it's that number divided by 2, 300, and if I just copy that formula down, then that tells me the size that it was, and we'll, um, should we do this again? Okay, so... In fact, I'll just move this up here. Um, right, okay. So the, I, I started with 600, then I had 300, then 150, and so on. We have a bit of a discussion with them about rounding off numbers and whatnot, but basically I got down to about one page after about 10 rows. Okay. So now we can work out that in fact, if I had um, 600 pages, and that was called a binary search, so I see it divides it in half all the time, it would take about 10 rips, and, and, and students could agree on a time that it would take to do each one. How long do we want to agree on for this? How long to rip a page in half? A second. A second, okay. Oh, that's nice and easy. Okay, so it would take 10 seconds. Uh, you might end up having to multiply by two, which would be an exercise for your spreadsheet. But, um, okay, so you'd estimate that if I was really going for it, I'd find that page in 10 seconds. Now, the next question is what if the book was twice as big? You open a phone book or something, right? So, um, instead of 10, how many times am I going to have to rip it in half? 11, yeah. 11, yeah. yeah. Write that out. Sure enough, because if I start with 1,200, the very first time I'm down to the size that I had before, and then I've got the 10 left to go. So, it actually, twice as big, it only takes one more go. Um, now, normally I go through this a bit slower with students, but um, instead of 1,000 pages, suppose we had um, a million pages. How many times can I rip a million page phone book in half? Um, this is a thought experiment <laughs> to get down to a particular one. In other words, you know, if you're a really big organisation with a million things to search through, and each time you look at one thing, you're narrowing it down. So what's with really an organisation with really big amounts of data to search through? Google. Yes, right. Funny, eh? Um, so yeah, with a million, how many times am I going to have to keep dividing in half? Well. Exactly, yeah. That's actually, um, yeah, it's line 21, so it's the 20th time. So, with a million pages, <coughs> it's only 20 seconds. Okay, and that's when you're doing it manually on the computer. Which I'm sorry, so, so, this algorithm is looking pretty good. Um, in fact, let's just get really carried away. Because, um, you, you notice the status says for a problem of size n. We're trying out different values of n here. Um, and computer scientists are particularly interested in the big values of n. We're not really interested in searching 100 items. Sometimes you've got to do that, but you really hope you've got a thousand customers or a, a million transactions a day or a, a billion pages that you're searching, a billion you know, uh, purchases or trading or something like that. So let's put in a billion, which is what I'm going to do. Zero, zero, six American billion. And okay, it is taking a few more. But, in fact, how many? 30. Yeah. So, a billion pages take about 30 seconds. Now, 
you can, and, and the students can pretty quickly see that like no matter what size thing you throw at this, it's you know it's not going to take more than a minute or so for a human to search it. Um, so that's one algorithm. The excellence, and, and that's that's actually sort of pretty much the um, merit level of the standard. Um, the excellence one says you have to compare two algorithms. So the other algorithm we're going to use is the unfortunate one for the unsorted phone book. Um, actually, I learned of another version of this. A, a friend of mine, it turns out, when he was a fifth former quite a few years ago, um, fancied a girl in, in his class, and he knew her phone number, but he didn't know her last name and stuff. And <laughs> yeah, and you know how it is when you're a fifth former and you fancy a girl, and, and, and time's no problem. And so, <laughs> all the guys in the guys know. <laughs> You didn't know that the guys were going. Through, girls didn't know that the guys were going through their phone books looking for phone numbers. That were so, the um, he spent an entire weekend going through every single phone number in the phone book. Uh, yeah, I forget how long he said it took him, but we can estimate it actually because um, if if you've got well, let's say you've got 600 pages and you need to go through every single thing on every single page. Um, I mean, well, let's let's give him a second per page, right? He's keen. He's okay. So, how many seconds is it going to take? To go through, and by the way, we call this searching algorithm a linear search or a sequential search because we're going through the whole thing. Um, so I'll call it sequential or linear, just depends what school you went to. Um, 600 pages is going to take roughly 600 seconds. And it's actually probably not a bad thing for your students to do that to minutes and hours and things like that. Um, but uh, we won't. So, face. We'll get back to the face issues. Um, that's fine, but the million pages go on second take. Million seconds. I worked out these values, I timed how long it would take. 
those are two algorithms. We haven't even touched a computer yet okay, to do that. Um, and, and that's fine because, in fact, a lot of computer scientists develop algorithms and analyze them um, without even writing a program. Um, and then sometimes they'll go and write it up and check that it actually works how they think, but, but they know before they've written it how long it's going to take, so why bother writing it? You already know it's going to suck, so uh, <laughs> it's not worth wasting your time doing it. So that's one way of presenting that. Um, free stuff. Another way, um, which has been, I've had a lot of fun with for students. Um, how many people have tried the balance scales and sorting and so on? Okay. So this is. Uh, I need a volunteer for this one, actually. So someone, to, someone to be a simulator theoretical student. You have to simulate attitude and all that. Yep, okay, thank you. I got the scales from Every Educate. Every Educate? But, um, but, you know, just a children teacher supply place, I think. A lot of schools, I think a lot of primary schools have them. Just going to nick one from me. Can, can I ask another teacher type of question? Yeah. Would you get one set of scales for the whole class, or would you get 15, 6? Yeah. No. That, that, that's these, a question. These, these are issues for teachers as opposed yeah. to how to teach something. It's yeah. How many resources and how many of them do you get? Well, the way they did this particular one, um, so I've done this with a few classes and I just did it with one set of scales. By getting, it, it's, it's not the one you expect, it's lots of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, actually, most of it can be done as a thought experiment, but um, so it's, it's the person who's actually doing it that suffers the most. But, uh, um, but uh, you know, aside from yourself, I mean, some places. Uh, um, where I've seen this done, they've actually just made scales too, like you just get a couple of um, uh, buckets, literally buckets, on a piece of piece of metal and a couple of strings hanging off under the buckets and hang it off something and you've got scales, as long as the weights are sufficiently different. Okay, so I've got, I think I've got 11 weights here. Uh, yep. And the first task for you is just to find the heaviest one. Okay. Using that and only comparing two at a time, and that's quite a good one actually. Just, just give, so computers generally uh, um, do things by comparing two values at a time. What we're ultimately interested in now is sorting things in order. Okay. Now, what algorithms? Someone else to articulate what algorithm should he be using to find the heaviest one? <laughs> the yellow ones. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Oh yeah. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Oh, yeah. Yellow ones. Oh, yeah. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. Yellow ones. So, so does someone want to try and articulate the algorithms? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so next. Linear or sequential, try everyone. Well, okay, but, but just the process. So imagine we're year 11s. Yeah. You're seeing what's happening, what should he do each time? He's keeping the heaviest one the heaviest down one. so far. Right, keep the heaviest one each time. No, so, so weigh them, keep the heaviest one, and throw the other one out. He's got the heaviest one? Yeah. 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 I gave you for your help because I couldn't. No, I thought there was an equal one of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of set up. Yeah. yeah, no. Okay, so so we've got the heaviest one. Yeah. Oh, which is this one here? That one there. Um, we'll put that to one side because we want we want them to go from the lightest to the heaviest. So the next task would be to find the second heaviest. Right? Uh, how would you find the second heaviest? Well, it goes through the same process. Yeah, same process on the ones that left over. While he's doing that, the rest of us will analyze the algorithm. And so when he had 11 weights, how many weightings did he do to find the heaviest out of 11? 10. 10. Okay. What answer are your 11 is most likely to say straight away? 11. Yeah. 11. Okay. So that's a good thinking point. There's actually 10 weightings that are being done. So, so sorting, we've got 11 weighings. How many weighings is he going to do for the next lot? Nine. Nine. We had 10, uh, here. Oh, sorry. Nine. 10, then 9. Then he's going to do 8. Okay. 
And what's the sum of those numbers? This is why you guys are teachers and not yeah. <laughs> Okay. If you had gone through the whole algorithm, uh, then what's the sum of all of those numbers? 55. Um, now, there's a couple of ways you could add that up. You could bung them in a spreadsheet and it will tell you. Um, there's another trick if you're into mass tricks, which is to reverse the list. So we just write down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, we don't know the sum of it, but we add them up in a different order. So we add all of these numbers up. 10 plus 1 is equal to 11 minus 2. So how many lots of 11 are there? So the sum of all of those are? Right. So I've added everything in twice, so the sum of a single column is half of that. 10, 2, 55. That's actually, um, again, you know, going a little bit fast here, but the students should be able to work that out for themselves. Um, now, more importantly, suppose I have 110 weights, 10 times as many. Um, so, so that's sorting 11 weights. And we actually analysed, we worked out it will take 55 comparisons to do it all thoroughly. Okay? Um, and so again, we didn't actually need to do it, so you can't see it actually. Thanks, yeah, that's great. Um, and well done. Right. <laughs> now, suppose I did have 110 weights okay, to sort into order, and he used exactly the same algorithm, the same process for doing it. How many comparisons, if you've got 110 weights, how many comparisons do you make to find the heaviest of those first? 109 comparisons. And then of the remaining 109, how many comparisons to find the heaviest? 108. Yeah, same pattern, just adding them from 109 down to 1. What's that add up to? Well, same trick, reverse the list, 1, 2, 3, down to 109. Each row is 110. And how many rows? Actually, one thing I'd ask the class before we actually calculate that, we've made this quick way. We go from 11 weights to 110 weights, so 10, 10 times as much stuff to sort. We go from 55. How many comparisons do you think it's going to take? 550. So, so my guess that it will take about 550. It's actually, so it's that number over 2, because we've added everything up twice, which is actually equal to, you want to go calculate it? Okay, so interesting, isn't it? Because we've got 10 times as much stuff to sort. We thought it might have taken 500 units, but it's actually taken more like 5,000 units. And in fact, that's the property of this particular algorithm, is if you give it 10 times as much stuff to sort, it will take about 100 times as long. Okay? It's not scalable, and it's not efficient, and it's not a good system to use. Um, we need better ways of sorting. Um, that one only is hardly ever used for anything because it's it basically. I mean, sometimes people say, well, one advantage is it's nice and simple, but that's no advantage. I mean, who wants to know that the software they've just pulled off you is actually easy to write? I mean, you know, it's really slow, but at least it's easy to write. Um, so, the um, again, analytically, we've worked out that that will take way too long. What's the name of that? The name of the algorithm for the question is, um, we're selecting the heaviest weight every time, so it's selection sort. So, and again, you see there's heaps of material there for projects. You know, pick out your own sizes, um, maybe show a few photos of doing it by hand, that sort of stuff. 
but the, I mean, the standard says that the student understands that there are different costs for different values of n, something like that. If a student actually has got a few calculations and a few demonstrations of that, then that's a very convincing case that they understand that there are different costs. Okay. Um, they say I just, you know, I, I did a learning search of a phone book and it took a weekend, then I think they've got a very big understanding of the costs of the, the long number. Um, so, so that's, that's another way of doing it. Um, yet another way is that you could actually use a computer program. And so, um, if we can uh, say this thing about um, what I've got here is a Python program that does selection sort. Okay. Um, it also does another sorting algorithm called quick sort, which, by the way, we, we might do in a minute if we've got time. Um, but the, the thing about the program is that it will do all that work for us. And the important thing is that your students don't have to write the program. This, this program is up on the Inzactive side, it's been there for a year, and it still says we're going to fix it up one day, but it works. Um, so basically, it shuffles a whole lot of values and then sorts them for you. And using selection sort and uh, quick sort, and we'll give it, the, so the number of keys that it's going to sort is 11, and we'll test quick sort and selection sort on it. So we'll just run those. Um, Could you move it over a bit? Oh, sorry. It's a bit away from the left. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. This program is actually quite bizarre to try and get my uh, super again. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, so the students do not need to be able to implement these programs. Remember the standard is understanding the cost of how long they take to run. Not understanding how, not even understanding how they work. In fact, even doing this, it's nice that they kind of can see what's going on, and it, it makes sense why it would take so long. And every time you add one weight, you're going to have to go through the whole list again, and things like that. But um, the reality is that just downloading and running this program that compares two different methods will tell you. And lo and behold, sorting 11 keys with selection sort takes 55 comparisons. That's the that's kind of a hard way of working it out. Um, you can just work it out quickly there. Um, and if I give it uh, 110 comparisons instead, and we run that, that's right, 110 things to sort, 110 keys took 5995, which is exactly what it told me before. Okay. Um, selection sort is very predictable. It's always going to take this ridiculous amount of time to do things. Um, by the way, some of you may come across bubble sort. Bubble sort's worse than selection sort. Okay, so, um, yeah. It's, it's often used as a programming example. Of, and again, one of the reasons that we want to teach computer science and not programming is that often they come out knowing a few things that are actually kind of not helpful. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's good to know what bubble sort is and how it works, but it's also good to know that you, you would almost never want to use it in practice. Yeah. Another one of the problems is a lot of the stuff that's taught is taught with doing this with five or eight or ten items. Ah, yes. And they do all the comparisons and say, hey, look, bubble sort works out pretty good most of the time. Yeah. You know, so they come to quite wrong conclusions yeah. because they've worked. It's, it's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. And of course, when you're demonstrating stuff on a board or with a set of scales, you only need to do 10 things or whatever, too. So I think one of the kind of mindsets that computer scientists have is they, they always say, well, that's nice. I understand it from that. But I want to know how it does with a million things. Um, because if, if it's no good for a million, then it's probably no good. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, 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 that's almost, there's almost this culture of computer science that, that is kind of always trying to think, well, would it scale? Okay. Is it efficient in general rather than in one particular case? Yeah. My, my question for the people who have done this this year is how did you go from this understanding to a student written report? And were there issues or ways of managing that? Uh, there are a number of websites that you can compare to comparisons. Give them two sorts and then ask them to analyze well, them. Well, I've there are about six sorts on this website. Mm -hmm. and see, okay, do a comparison to a little bit. So you can go. But lots of big numbers in. So um, th this probably isn't the website that you're talking about, but um, uh, what's it called? Sorting algorithms. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, SAA, yes, is another one. Yes. Um, if, in the NZ site, there's um, links to all of this material, right? Um, so there's resources for computer science, and especially under our picks, these are, these are most of the ones that are linked to. Um, this is one that's just more visual, um, but you can, um, you can basically bring up um, a whole lot of sorting algorithms. Yeah, screen move just instead. Um, and, and just get it to run them on, on different problem sizes and you know there's selection sort working and the way that's working is it's the height of the stick so you can see the small one's been selected then the second smallest then the third smallest and so on and again the students you know, they might be able to see that the, the amount that it's going through it's getting smaller and smaller in the same way that with the scales it's getting smaller and smaller um, so it's a visualization of it but yeah the, the SAAS site um, actually then tells you how many comparisons were done or how much time was taken too. And yeah, if, if they just, again, type all that into a spreadsheet and do a graph of it, and for heaven's sake, label the graph and, you know, all that sort of stuff and make it meaningful and try and draw a conclusion from it. Um, but what they will inevitably get if they draw a graph um, is that selection sort whipped, um, you know, they'll, they'll get points like this and, and maybe some sort of line like that, and the quick sort method is <coughs> supposed to be faster, will probably go out something like that, which means when you get out to your millions or whatever, that it's actually not unreasonable, but this one has just gone through the roof. It's, it's never going to finish. So it's really important that the kids do put labels on, because they actually don't really analyze their graph correctly, yeah. if they don't say what they're actually analyzing. Or well, say, and the red line is, when they're printing yes, the right. and going on. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and up here it, it could be time taken or number of comparisons. Both of those are a measure of the cost. Okay? Either would be fine. Um, yeah, and ideally, in, you know, in, in a good scientific system, you should actually just have the label beside the line to make it absolutely clear. But Excel doesn't really encourage that. We end up with really hard to read graphs quite easily. So, so, so just again, the people have done it, did you give them a couple of sorts and ask them to give you an analysis, or did you teach this and then ask the students to summarise the, what, what they've learned? I just, I'm just interested in ways of turning this into individual work. What we did, Max, was um, I, Tim actually, I was very fortunate, Tim could come in and he spoke to my class and he spoke about the sorting. So I didn't want them to just regurgitate what Tim had said. So I did um, the linear and the binary search. And essentially I said to them, look, ask your friends for uh, two songs, they two favorite songs. So they had five friends, two favorite songs, 10. So they had a sort of like a virtual library of 10. So like, put all the names in the head. Now pick one out and then tell me how are you going to find that one out of your list? And they had to sort of explain what they did with the linear search and then what did they have to do with the binary search? Because we discussed this, that they would have to sort first and then do it. But the key thing is that they must actually write their own stuff. Um, if they just copy and paste that and stick it in there, they actually haven't shown any learning. So the key thing is to actually individualize. Because it comes back to what Tim was saying earlier on, they need to communicate they have demonstrated understanding. So That's you really had two searches and asked the students to analyse it and give you a report on it? Yeah, the but they must try and put it in their own way. They actually have to show they have understood. Um, and yep, so they can write that. Because what you also got to realise is this particular standard, if I'm correct, counts for the literacy as well. So writing is important. Um, and that's, we've got to keep that in mind. They have to be able to communicate what they have done. Did but anyone else do a different method for that? Or did everyone do something similar to that? One of the things that I, like system smartness, saw was very obviously the teacher has given a demonstration and everyone in that, from that school has the same numbers and the same example in their written report. Like, you know, when you do a binary search, you always get the answer four because four was the one that was given as how many searches it took for the three that they chose. They all seem to choose the same one. So it's, it's, it's very easy quite, to personalize. Quite difficult, obviously, yeah. to teach it and get them to do their own you know, research on it. 
So, so here's an example of you know, the skinny bench a, a, a program, and, and by the way, there's scratch programs that do this as well that are available. Um, if, um, and it could be done in any language. But um, basically, it, it's, it says how many comparisons. So interesting in Quicksort is very hard to, it almost never does the same thing. So um, although that's always 5995, Quicksort you know, took 1,096 comparisons that time. Um, but if we run it again, um, it took 1,077, and the next time it took 1,062. It depends what the data is. So you can see that it's kind of telling a story about how good it is compared with selection sort. But, but it's, a, it's also a personal one. You know, I ran it on these values. Even just choosing 110 or 120, and so, you know, all those values, if the student um, can sort of personalize those, it makes it very clear. Or, or you know, I'm searching my favorite list of pop songs or something like that. Um, <coughs> It just, you know, it just avoids regurgitating and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and, and also, the whole point is that this is a great experience for them to do. Um, we did it, when I did it with the class, we had 20 people at computers and they all ran it for different sizes. And the ones with, um, uh, on Scratch, I think when they got up to about a, sorting 100 items, it took in the order of 20 minutes or something like that. And, and of course, their mates around here had finished in one minute and it's just taken forever. Whereas the people of Quicksort were finishing and getting on to the next experiment straight away too. So they were, they were actually experiencing the slowness of the algorithms as well. Can Quicksort be demonstrated with the weights? Yes. Come on up. Right. This will be our last thing. Thanks. So, pick a weight at random. And uh, we'll compare it with all the others. So this time, leave it in the yellow bucket. But everything that's heavier, put on one side. And everything that's lighter, put on the other side. There's a video of this too. Oh, uh, your clip drives, by the way, have got videos on them. Uh, uh, yeah. I <laughs> Great. You see, you only need one set of scales. The rest of the class are going to learn it. Um, and so, the um, yeah. So, so quick sort is basically. That's the main algorithm, okay. okay? And the one that you've got goes in the middle. So we know now that, whoops, that's all the light ones, that's the heavy ones. How's he going to get them sorted now? Right. Sort that pile. Oh, sort that pile, yeah. Okay. Um, how are you going to sort this pile? Same way, yeah. So pick one at random, small stuff on one side, big stuff on the other. So, um, no, no, no. It's still going to stay in this group here. But within that, making another, another, another subset. Three. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually, he'll get down to sorting one item, and you don't have to do anything because one item is sorted. Now, again, your students don't really need to know that, but it's not that hard. Um, the video that, that we've got up of it is a 12 year old girl doing it. Um, with, and, all, and all we did is give her the same instructions. <laughs> um, but some students will struggle, others will be fascinated by the recursive nature of it, that you, know, you, sort, you sort by sorting, but then you sort those bits by sorting them. Yeah. No, I'm confused. Is that all right? <laughs> It's certainly quite feasible for a, for a 